Today we're going to be taking a look at some new video lighting I've bought myself, which are these two Niwa 660 bicolour LED panels. For the last few years I've used a pair of fairly cheap softboxes to do my videos, and while they've worked fine, I did a video of them years ago when I got them, they're just getting a bit bored, like tiresome. The colour temperature is a very cool colour, which isn't ideal because it doesn't really match the warmer light bulbs I have in these rooms, and they're not that brilliant at colour rendering, colours aren't particularly, colours don't look particularly vibrant under them, and they're always a bit of a pain to try and colour correct. They're also just physically really large, and I just constantly end up falling over them and bashing into them, and then they're a pain to reassemble and disassemble, so I, have to, I just generally store them fully assembled, they take up a huge amount of space. And then even then, I've just had a few issues with like bulbs and fuses blowing while I'm trying to use them, which is a bit of a pain when you're trying to film a video, so I decided to replace them. So I went for these LED panels here, which are pretty inexpensive, at about £85 each. There's links in the description. Now, Neewer do a wide range of LED panels. These are the 660 model, so the number they give you is the number of LEDs, so the 660 is one of their sort of higher LED count panels, which just gives more light output. These are also a bicolour model, so while they're not RGB, they do RGB ones as well, these let you change the colour temperature between a warmer colour and a cooler colour, which is why I went for these, because I can then match the colour temperature in the rooms. Then within the 660 bicolour model, there's a few different types, and it's worth bearing in mind the differences because they're all around the same price, so you want to make sure you get the right one for your needs. It's a bit hard to talk about the titles on the, sell on the listings because they're all just a bit vague, but the trick is to look at the back of them. Some of the more basic ones just have a knob for the yellow LEDs and a knob for the cooler LEDs, and you can just adjust those, the cool LEDs and the warm LEDs independently and get some sort of rough temperature. They then do other models that have an LCD screen on the back, and that can give you an actual numerical readout of the colour temperature and brightness. So those are potentially a bit better, and they're around the same price. Then we have this model here, which also has the readout of, of temperature, but it's also got app control over Bluetooth. Now, I don't really care about the app control over Bluetooth at all, but it just so happened that these were the exact same price as the ones that have the screen on the back but don't have app control, so I didn't really see a reason not to go for these ones because they still are controllable manually in the exact same way as the other ones. The app control is just an extra feature. They then do an even more expensive one that's more expensive than these that they call 2.4G, which I think means 2.4 gigahertz, and it comes with a little wireless, presumably 2.4 gigahertz remote, those are more expensive because they, can, they include the remote control, but they could be useful if you want to actually remotely control them. So I've bought two of these. These, as I said, were £85.99 each. They also do different kits. You can get them including stands and all that sort of stuff. I've already get, got lighting stands with soft boxes, and there's no point in replacing them because otherwise I'll just have even more light stands lying around. So I just bought the panels themselves. So what we'll do is we'll get one of these out of the way, and we'll take a look at the other one. So first we'll do a quick unboxing. I'll put chapters down below in case people want to skip through it. But let's take a quick look at what you get. So we open that up, and they come in a nice case. So that's quite good. So you can actually have, you get a little case you can carry them around in, which is quite nice to have. And it feels okay. We open it up. See what we get. So sit there and sit there, and let's open it. So we get some warranty cards and instructions, presumably QR codes to go to their website. Yeah, just boring stuff there. And here we see the LED panel. So that's in the case there, it doesn't quite fit, but I suppose it works. Um, that's the panel there, we'll take a look at it in a second. And then as for other included accessories, you then get a power brick and an IEC power cable. So it does have an IEC connector, which is good, so you can sort of extend it to whatever length you need. But obviously the length between the power brick and the connector here is fixed, so if you're mounting it really high up, you may need to figure out a solution of mounting this off the ground. But yeah, that's a power brick. And as you'll see in a second, they can also be battery operated, but I'm just going to mains operate them for now. That's the inside of the bag there. It's maybe not ideal for transporting it around, because it is just like, it's, it's, it's foam, it's not polystyrene. But I'd, it'd be interesting to see how durable this would be with like long-term use. I have a feeling this might start to crumble after a wee while, but yeah, you do have sort of a carrying case you can carry it in. Now let's take a look at the light itself. So that's the light there. Definitely has a good bit of weight to it, and it feels all metal construction, which is really good. So now, on the front, if you open it up, you've got these barn doors. These are removable, there's screws in the corners, you can take those barn doors off if you, off you don't want them, or you can just, you know, fold them out of the way. These also, obviously, act as barn doors to help you sort of direct the light, but they also just act as good protection for the panel. Under here, there's the LED panel, you can see 
sort of see the LEDs through it, but there's also this diffusion layer. Now that can be popped out around the side, so there's a little button here, you can push that in, and then slide this panel out, and that'll give us a better look at the LEDs. This is just to slightly diffuse the LEDs, so they don't show as individual points of light, and there's like shadows, that won't, you won't see all lots of separate shadows from each LED, this will try and diffuse it a little bit. And that's all the LEDs there. And you can maybe see the different colours. There's some that are slightly different colours than others because they're different, different rows are the alternate between warm white and cool white. And by adjusting the intensity of the warm white and cool white ones, you can mix temperature around. So you've got diffusion layer there. Now, it's still worth bearing in mind this is still quite a point source of light. It's not going to be as soft as my original soft boxes. So that's worth bearing in mind that they will cast some more shadows and, not be, and be a little bit more directional than a softbox. But what Neewer also sell is they sell a softbox add-on for this that I've not bought yet, but I might do in the future. That you can basically clip over this panel and it turns it into a softbox, but it's a lot smaller than a normal softbox. So that could be a nice little addition. So that's the front of it there. And it is nice that those barn doors fold over and protect the panel. So you can sort of transport it around without worry. Next up you've got this little mount, so that's hinged like that. And you can also, on the side, there's a second tripod mount, or screw mount, so you can actually unscrew this here and move this down to here to give yourself a bit more distance between the base of the light and the bar here, which could be useful. I'll show you it mounting on a pole later, but then you've got this pole mount here that'll fit on a standard light pole. And then around the back we can see the controls. So I'll demonstrate this actually working later, but if we peel the plastic off, to make it look clearer. You've got a little screen here that just shows the colour temperature and the brightness percentage. You've got a pair of knobs down the bottom. One to set the brightness and one to set the colour temperature. A channel slash activate button. That's to set the Bluetooth channel. So when you're using it on Bluetooth control with the app, you can assign the lights different channel numbers. I think 1 to 8 I think it does. And that lets you control multiple lights at a time from one app. There's DC barrel input which is 12 volts to 15 volts. The brick they supply is 12 volts, but it's good to have a bit of a range there so you don't have to use their included brick. If you were using this in a special setting where you had a specific power supply, you could actually use these. And then finally here you've got two battery connectors. These take standard Sony F550, F750, F970 batteries, which are very standard batteries used for camcorders. And then because they're so common on camcorders, lots of LED lighting panels have adopted them. So they're really cheap to get fairly generic batteries that'll fit these, as well as external chargers. Apparently you can run it on one battery or two, and running it on two will give you extended lifespan. I'm not going to be running it on battery power for now, I'm just going to mains power them, but it is really nice to have that option. And down here you've got a power switch that lets you alternate between battery power on the left and mains power on the right. So that's also good, because you can have the batteries in here, but actually switch it that way and run it on mains power and not drain the, ba drain the batteries down. So that's really cool. But it is worth bearing in mind that I don't think you can charge the batteries in this. I think you have to charge them on an external charger and you can only insert them into this to then power the light. I'll double check that, but I think that's the case. But yeah, that's the light there. So what I'll now do is I'll go away, try them out a little while, test them out, probably film a couple of videos with these before I then release this video, and then I'll come back and show them all working, show the operation of them, then I'll come back with my review. Okay, so I'm now back after using these lights for a few weeks, and I can say these are really, really good. In fact, my last few videos were filmed with these, so if you want to judge the quality, you can go and look at those. Right now, I'm using one of them to film this, so that one's what you're seeing here, and that's, it's just that and then the room lights, so the shadows might be a bit worse than previous videos, and it might, you know, it might just not be quite as bright, but that's because obviously one of the lights is down here. But yeah, I'm very impressed with these. Now, as for the build quality, I'm extremely impressed. They seem extremely durable. I've even transported these out of the house, and I've had no issues with, with them at all. Obviously it's plastic here in the back, so you wouldn't want to like drop it on concrete, but I've got no problems about throwing these around or storing them outside the cases. Because while it does come with a the case, they're a little bit fiddly to get everything packed in and the foam isn't amazing. So it's fine if you're transporting them long distances or whatever, but to store these, I actually just store them out the cases in a drawer vertical like that, and they both sit next to each other. And because the barn doors can sit over the front, it seems very secure, and they're not worried about it getting damaged. Now as for mounting these, you've got the standard lighting mount on the bottom. You also have these tripod screws on the side, which I mentioned before, you could actually obviously move this up and down. You could, could also use these to actually just mount this onto a tripod vertically, but I don't know why you would. But yeah, the main way to, way to mount this is using this mount, mount at the bottom. So I've got a light pole here, 
this is the sort of standard one you'd want to use. And generally speaking, you would insert it like that, tighten it up like this here, and that's it now mounted. So what you now have is a light that can vertically sit like that. And that is quite an easy way of doing it. So if you've got light like that, it'll just start to sit vertically. Now there is however one downside of having it mounted vertically like this, and that is if you're using the barn doors. So if you open up the barn doors like this, as you sort of normally would have them when you're using the light, the downside you'll find is when you've got it mounted vertically on the pole like this, you can't tilt it down beyond this point because this bottom barn door fills it. So for example if I was to shut that bottom barn door, it would then move more but then the side barn doors would get in the way. So if you want to mount it vertically on a pole like that, it doesn't really fit well with the barn doors. Now the barn doors are removable so you could take them off and use without them, but there is another way. And that is that you take it off the pole, like that, and instead mount it through here. So there's these additional holes here, so you can mount the light the pole through like that. And now with it mounted on the pole like that, the bars here come out forwards. And what you can then do is you can then swivel the light round like that, open the barn doors fully, and instead have the light hanging off the pole at an angle like that. And that gives you a lot more degrees of motion. You can, as before, have it pointing straight out, but you can also angle it down, and you can angle it down as far as pointing totally straight down. So that gives you a lot more motion. Now, the one thing I did find with this is obviously you've now got a lot of weight hanging off one side of the pole, and that does mean that your poles may be a bit more unstable, so you may want to weight the bottom down, or just use higher quality light poles, because the ones I've got are quite cheap and they don't have much weight to them. So they do sometimes lean forward a little bit, so I tend to have to angle the light so that one of the tripod legs is sticking out in front of it. But that is quite a good way of mounting it, so it's worth bearing that in mind. That if you're using these, I actually find this a much, more easy, much better way of mounting it. It just gives me a lot more degrees of motion for tilting this up and down. But yeah, the mounting of this does seem pretty flexible. I've not really had any issues. And definitely being able to just move these around is so much easier than those old soft boxes. That's the main thing I've noticed with this, is while the light output is better, just the convenience factor is huge. Because these are just so much easier just to quickly move around, angle in different positions, get them close up for certain shots, take them between rooms, I can have one easily pointing straight down like that. In fact, I'm actually tempted to try and get one of these, another one of these and mount it on the ceiling pointing straight down just to give a sort of fill light across the table because they're just so flexible. And plus, trying to film with these is so much easier because I'm no longer trying to reach around big soft boxes. They're just so much smaller that I can easily get in to film, to film what I'm at, to work on what I'm actually trying to film rather than trying to battle past lights. So yeah, the form factor of these is really good. The mounting is really good. I'm dead happy. So now let's take a look at this working. So I've got the power supply we can just plug in. I haven't got any batteries here right now to test it with. But I did do a thing a while ago with a friend where we were needing more light, so he had some and I had these ones. So I borrowed some batteries off him to use, and it actually worked absolutely fine. We only actually used one battery per light because we didn't have enough, but it works fine. Slot the battery in, flip the battery setting, and it gives you, even gives you a battery percentage meter on the screen, or a battery bar on the screen, which is really good. I might get some batteries. The mains power is fine for now, but the one thing I have found is because it's got that external power brick, I'm constantly kicking those around the floor or tripping over them because they're quite big. So it would be nice to have batteries, but the mains power is fine. So that's plugged in there. Press the switch here, that'll turn it on. So the light's obviously on. Now the barn doors are currently shut in the front, so you won't really see the light coming out. But you can see on the screen, you can see the output you get. So let's quickly look at the interface. What you'll have is on the left, you've got the, the dim control, which is the brightness. On the right, you've got CCT, which is the color temperature. So you can turn the brightness up and down and also move the color temperature around. And for the most part, it retains its settings. Sometimes I've found when I've turned it on, it's come back at a different brightness or color temperature from what I switched it off at. But for the vast majority of the time when I turn it on, it restores its settings. So it's a bit weird it doesn't do that all the time, but it is nice that it generally ret retains the settings. So I don't have to reconfigure them both every time. It would be worse if they both came on at a totally random setting. Most of the time they remember, especially between quick power off and power on cycles. Now, in terms of this, you'll find that the brightness goes up in stages of 10% and the colour temperature goes up in stages of 100 Kelvin. Now, this is something that I didn't realise when I got this and it's a bit of a difference between the, two, the various models that I mentioned earlier. 
As I mentioned, this is the app controlled Bluetooth one, and we'll talk about that in a second. But what I suspect that means is because the app is controlling the brightness and setting and color temperature of this, they've used rotary encoders down here. So these don't have like a minimum and maximum hard stop, they're not potentiometers. They just permanently turn one way or permanently turn the other way, and then they just change the values on the screen. And as a result, the brightness goes in stages of 10%. Colour temperature in stages of, stages of 100 is okay, that's not really a problem, but 10% on the brightness is fine, but it isn't as fine-grained as I'd necessarily like. It works absolutely fine, but if this was a bit more fine-grained, that would be ideal. Now, when I use my friend's light, he's got the same one, he's got the Niwa 660 LED panel, but he's not got the app-controlled version. He's got the one that has a brightness and colour temperature set control, so they've got two separate controls, and it has an LCD readout, but it's not got app control. Now, that one behaved slightly differently. On that one, the brightness control and the colour temperature control almost felt like they were analogue controls controlling the LED, and then the screen was almost like a analogue to digital readout of those settings. So when you were turning the brightness and colour temperature up and down, they were changing totally linearly rather than 10% steps, and then the percentage readout on the screen was roughly reflecting what you'd set it to, to the extent that if you set it, you know, on certain type brightnesses, the screen would almost flick between two brightnesses, like within a percent. So that gave you a bit more fine, fine grain control, whereas this one does go in steps. So if you don't want to use a Bluetooth control, you're not interested in that, and you just want to use manual controls on the device, you might actually be better going for the one that has an LCD, but without the Bluetooth control, because it will give you slightly more fine grain brightness control on the device itself, rather than this one, which is steps in terms of steps in 10% increments. But the controls are pretty good, the screen's really clear as well which I like, so yeah I'm absolutely happy with this. Next up we've got the control for Bluetooth channel. Now there's eight channels on this and then there's channel zero which I think is like a sort of a channel you can put lights on that then are controlled if you try and control all the lights at the same time, but if you press channel activate and use the colour temperature control that cycles through different channels. So what you can do here is you can assign the light to a channel, so when you're using the app, which we'll take a look at in a second, you can have groups of lights controlled independently from the app, or control them in groups. And interestingly, when you turn this channel selector here, the colour on this LED changes. You might be able to see that. So I think that basically means that, I think that's purely just a bit of eye candy and a bit of a sort of thing, so if you're like looking at the lights from a distance, you can easily tell what channel they're on for the colour. Then again, this screen's quite big, so it's not too bad. But yeah, we'll take a look at the app control in a second, so that's how that works there. Now, we'll quickly take a look around the front just to see it actually operating. This will probably be very bright on the camera, but that's it there. And if I turn the brightness down, you should see the different colour temperature of LEDs. So I'll, drop, I'll adjust the camera a little bit so you can maybe see it a little bit easier. And there we go, you're now able to see the LED panel. And this is set to 10% brightness, just so the camera can see it really. And this is around 4400 Kelvin. And I've worked out that roughly speaking, that is right in the middle of the range that this can do. So it means that all the LEDs are on 100% brightness. But what you can quite clearly see here is you've got the alternating rows of cool, cool white LEDs and warm white LEDs. So when you mix them together to a sort of middle color temperature, you see them all. Now, if I turn the color temperature, down to more warm, you'll see we only have the warm LEDs. If we then try and put that up, you can see it slowly starts fading between the warm LEDs and the cool LEDs start coming in, and then we go back and we only have cool LEDs. Now you probably can't see the step difference really on here just because it's totally blowing out the camera, but it does work quite well. Now the one thing I have found, if we turn that light off, is the steps between the warmest temperature and one below, one above that is quite significant. So what I'll do is I'll move that light out of the shot and I'll try and bring in like just a white thing just to look at. So there's a bit of paper and what I'll, what I'll try not to do is I'll be quite balanced on the current tem on the current temperature which is 4400 Kelvin but then I'll not change the white balance as I do this shot. So I'll use the light I've got overhead and I'll turn the room lights off just so they don't have an influence in it. And what we'll do is we'll go through to cut the colour temperatures. So that's 4400 Kelvin, which is what I'll be classing as white in this. And if we go down to the warmest, 
that's us on 3200 Kelvin. Now, what I have found is that because 3200 Kelvin is purely the warm white LEDs, as soon as you turn it to 3300 Kelvin, there's quite a marked jump as it brings on the cool white LEDs. And then going 3300 Kelvin to 3400 Kelvin, Kelvin isn't as big a jump. So when you go through the main sort of scale, the biggest jump you'll see is going from the warmest to the next warmest, or from the coolest, which is here at 5600 Kelvin, to the next coolest, just because you're now bringing in the other colour of LED, even on its lowest brightness, and that provides quite a big jump compared to just slightly brightening them up. But it's not too bad at all. And that there shows a full colour temperature range. That's us on 5600 Kelvin, and that's us then down on 3200 Kelvin. Now, as you can probably imagine with these LEDs, because you've got the different rows, it will be at its brightest when you're in the middle with all LEDs on full at around 4400 Kelvin. So that's generally where I film, because I'm filming in a room where the lights in the room are probably around about 4400 Kelvin anyway, and I can just set the colour temperature adjustment on the camera, I can set the white balance, so I may as well have it set to 4400 Kelvin just to get the brightest possible light. But what's really good with this brightness control is that I can easily turn it to be warmer or cooler depending on the other lights in the room. And this is potentially quite important in certain situations. Because if you're, for example, filming in a room that's got warm white LEDs or just warm white bulbs in gen general, and you're wanting to have them on for you know artistic reasons or whatever, you probably want to have your, your LED panels also matching that colour temperature, so you want them warmer. Likewise, if you're filming, say, outside, and you've got a bit of sunlight, but it's maybe a bit overcast and you just need a bit more light, you'll want to turn these all the way to the coolest colour temperature at 5600 Kelvin to match the sunlight. If you had someone in sunlight and you're filming them with a much warmer light on them, it'll look weird. So while I don't use the colour temperature adjustment too much just in this room, purely because this room has a essentially 4400 Kelvin lights, I have found when I'm filming in other rooms like the living room, which has warmer lights, it is really nice to be able to turn this to a much warmer setting because that just means the colour temperatures all match between all, all your lights in the room. So yeah, I'm very happy with the controls of these. They're dead easy to use, no problems there at all. My only real complaint is just that on this particular model with the Bluetooth, you're limited to having the brightness going up in steps of 10%, which is a little bit too, too stepped for my liking. Mainly just because at the lowest brightness, 10% is, can potentially be a bit brighter than you'd want and you might want to go a bit below that. But yeah, apart from that, the controls are really good. But what I would say is if you need the Bluetooth control, get the Bluetooth one. If you don't need the Bluetooth control, you may want to look at the one without it that still has an LCD because it will give you slightly more fine grained control. So now let's take a look at the app control. So as you can see here, I've opened the app and we've first of all met with the main gripe I have about this app, and I'm probably going to rant a lot about this, it requires you to log in with an account. Now, you'll see down here there's this tourist mode option, which if you go in you can flick through the app just to see what the UI is like, and kind of play around with it, but as soon as you go to like add a light, it forces you to log in, so you do need to log into the app to use it. Now, this is a major complaint for me, for a couple of reasons. First of all, long-term support. To log into an app, it requires Neewer servers to be active to let me log in and to authenticate my user. Something like these lights, I'm probably going to keep for many, many years. So who's to say that in three, four, five years time, the servers running this app will still be around and the app will still be supported. All it takes is Neewer to go out of business or just to stop supporting this app. And if that happens, I won't be able to log into the app anymore to control the lights and I'll lose that functionality, which would be really annoying. Had the app worked without requiring an account, it even means that I could keep the APK of the app, the Android package, stored somewhere safe. And even if in five, six years time, Neewer will go out of business, stop releasing the app, it disappears off the Play Store, I can still install the app and use my lights. Whereas with this, because it requires that login, the app could easily stop being supported and could stop working. And realistically, I can't think of any technical reason that this app would require a login. Now, if it, for example, had a system where you could have one phone connected to the light and then you could use another phone on the same account to then control the light and then it, you know, it would relay through Neewer's server from one phone to the other phone 
and then the other phone would relay it over Bluetooth so you could control them across the internet over really long distances. Then I could maybe excuse it, but I would still expect to have some sort of guest or non-login mode button that I could go into and still control the lights. And likewise, you might want to argue that, oh, if you register it in the app, it might register warranty service or something, which I don't know if it does, it might. But even then, there should still always in my mind be a guest mode that I could use. So it's really annoying this doesn't have it. But with all that complaining out of the way, let's log into the app, which I still majorly object to having to do, and we'll see if it works. So I'm in the app here after logging in, and we can see we're seeing one light already. That's this one down here. So I'll quickly add the other one, which is dead easy to do. You just press it, finds both devices, one's connected, one isn't, click the other one, and that's now added as well. So it is really easy to add lights to this. Now, we can press these buttons to turn the lights on and off. So that's turn this one off, this one on. Same with the one overhead. And when you turn it off here, you can see it flashes like a little clock on the screen because the power supply itself is still switched on. And I imagine it would be the same if you're on battery. You'd want some indication because there's a difference between being it, it being permanently off or it being off because of Bluetooth but still connected over Bluetooth. And what I have found is it's actually really quick if I turn off the light here and turn it back on again, it's really quick for the app to connect again. So there's no issues there around mucking around with Bluetooth pairing. The connection and pairing is really easy. I mean, these are using modern Bluetooth LE standards, so it's, it's efficient and quick. It's not the old style Bluetooth, put it into pairing mode, copy pin type stuff. It's, it's really easy to use. Now, if we go into one of the lights, we can see we have the brightness and the color temperature. So we can increase that there, decrease that. And then same here for the colour temperature, that's the brightness of that light, and then the colour temperature as well. Now, you may have noticed something on the screen there. After all my ranting earlier about this knob that only goes in 10% increments, if you use the app, you can do it in individual percentage increments. So you've got to 100%, or you can even have it all the way down on 1%. And right enough, if that's 1% there, and that's 10%, there is a noticeable brightness difference between those. So it's not as though like 1% on the app isn't actually 1%. The light can clearly go in 1% increments and that provides a much more smoother operation. So that does mean that if you did buy these lights, you can still get that fine grain brightness control, but you have to use the app. So for me, that's a little bit annoying because I don't really want to use the app. I'd rather just use the light, but, and I did just buy the Bluetooth one because it was the same price and thought, well, why not have that function? But you do have that feature. Now, as for controlling multiple lights, you can see this one's on channel one, the other one is on channel zero, so which is that catch all channel. So if I were to press the all button here and then change the brightness, that's now controlling both lights independently because, or both lights together, because this one is channel one, the other one's channel zero, but because I've pressed all, it's caught under that category of all. Put it back to channel one again, we only control this light. Now, if I try and change the channel on the light that's overhead, that's now on channel one. So now that will now control again alongside this. But if I were to put the light above, for example, to channel two, oh, there you go. The light above is now channel two. And you can see at the top of the app here, channel two is now showing up. And if I keep cycling through this, you'll see it automatically jumps through showing all the different channels the lights are on. So you can now see I've got a light on channel one and channel two. Press channel two, that's the overhead light. Press channel one, that's the light that's on the table. And then if I press the all button, that's them both operating at the same time. Obviously the camera auto exposure is probably going all over the place at this point, so it'll be a little bit harder to tell the brightness changes. It's probably better for changing color temperature. But you can see that's controlling both lights at the same time. That's controlling just the light that's on the table. And that's controlling just the overhead light. So light on the table, light overhead. So the, the app control is really slick. You just need, it's just that account thing. But yes, yeah, so the app control works there. And you can do the brightness in steps of 1%, as I mentioned earlier. And the colour temperature is still in steps of 100%, so it's, or 100 Kelvin. So the, the, the colour temperature control is stuck at 100 Kelvin increments, but that's actually fine. 
and then the brightness control can now go in 1% if you're using the app. Now the other feature the app has is the ability to have almost two presets for each light. So you can see here we're currently at 50% brightness, 4400 Kelvin. Now maybe I want to turn it up to 100%, there we go. And then down the bottom you've got these two buttons, you've got one and two. So we're currently on one, if I press two, we can then say, I don't know, we want to now have this preset to be 3200 Kelvin at 50% brightness. And then now what will happen is I can cycle between these two modes. So I can press the button one and it'll go back to 100% brightness, 4400 Kelvin, or press two and it'll go to 50% brightness, 3200 Kelvin. So that's quite a nice little option. And that's per light. So it's not like you have that globally, it's just per light. However, the one thing just to bear in mind that's not the biggest issue, but it's just important to know, is that it almost sends two commands to the light. One to change the brightness and one to change, change the color temperature. So when you switch, you might notice that it'll do, it'll change the brightness and the color temperature separately. You might be able to make it out. It almost steps a little bit. So that's fine if you're just using change presets, but just bear in mind that you probably wouldn't want to do that while filming. You couldn't really use that feature to be filming someone and then quickly change the brightness and color temperature during a shot because you would see that step. Now, if you're only changing the brightness or the color temperature, that would be fine. For example, if I went to preset two, put the brightness up to 100% and then flick between them, you're not gonna notice the change because it's only changing one attribute. But if you're changing both, you will notice that step. But yeah, that's a nice little feature to have. So as for the app control, it's an annoying one because this app is absolutely fantastic. It works brilliantly. It's super easy to use it. There's no issues I've had connecting it to the devices or anything like that I was worried about. It's very intuitive. It's got loads of features. It's perfect. Apart from that stupid decision that forces you to log in. And I just can't see a reason for it. Like they're local devices. They're just using Bluetooth LE. There's nothing going over the internet just to use these lights. So unless they're using it just to collect telemetry data, which shouldn't really be done in such a way that it'll like adversely, adversely affect the user, it just seems unnecessary. Oh, but there's a, there's a Shopify shop in here you can use to buy accessories. Well, that's not useful. I'd rather just use the app without a login. And my main complaint isn't around data collection, although that is also annoying. It's around the fact that I want this thing to last for a long time and not have to worry about the app going out of support in the future. So yeah, that is definitely a complaint. And if Neo were watching this, please fix it because that's just really stupid and it really lets the whole thing down. But yeah, it's got the app control. You just need an account for it. Now, as for the light output, I'm extremely happy with the quality of it. The light's just really clean. The colors are great. There's The colors underneath it look pretty good. I've not had any issues with it casting any sort of green hue or any sort of hue on the, on the stuff you're filming. If I set the correct color temperature on the camera, it just works perfectly without requiring any real white balance or anything after the fact. The only thing I've found is that it sometimes blows reds out a little bit. So I've noticed that if I bring something red in, like, I don't know, this box, it maybe fluoresces a little bit more than I'd want. And if I bring skin in, again, skin can maybe look a little more red than I would normally go for. Now, this part here, I've actually removed the color grade that I have because all I normally do to fix this is I use uh, the hue saturation curve in DaVinci Resolve and I just slightly drop the reds. And when I do that, you can see it totally fixes it. So it's maybe it blows the reds out a little bit, but it's a lot better than those fluorescent soft boxes, which just made everything look green and had no real color reproduction. So I'm pretty happy with that. Now, as for hardness versus softness, these aren't too hard, but they are a lot harder than my soft boxes, which just means they do cast some more shadows just because the light is a bit more directional. It's not as diffused. So you probably won't see it too badly, but if I bring an object like a screwdriver, you can see it does cast fairly harsh shadows, especially if I bring the other one down. The shadows are a little bit more significant than you'd normally get with a sort of soft box, but it's not deadly. Compared to my old soft boxes, it really just means that I need to position them a bit more carefully. So I can't just set two lights up pointing at the table and just work with it. I just need to think about where the camera is, where the lights are, and maybe move them around a little bit just to prevent those harsh shadows. But it's not too bad at all. And it's definitely better than, better than say the average just LED light bulb. It does diffuse it a little bit with that diffusion panel in there. 
You can also remove that diffusion panel and that will help the increase the light output very slightly. However, when you do that, it can cause some slight issues because what you've essentially got with that diffusion panel, taking it out now, is it spreads all the light from all the individual LEDs into a single light source. So if I pull the one out from the top light, you can see the, the light output does go up quite a bit, but it may be, but as you can see, the shadows are probably gonna get a lot harsher. Like, look how harsh that is. And what you might not be able to see on the camera because it's just, it's gonna be a weird one to try and make out, but now you can almost see it. You can see when I hold the screwdriver away from the surface, what is a fine shadow almost widens. And what you almost get, and it's, you won't be able to really see it on camera, but the shadows look weird. And it's because what you've got like this is you've got all the individual LED bulbs focusing independently of each other on slightly different points. So it means that the shadow is almost like, you've almost, rather than having one single light source, you've almost got 660 little light sources all slightly in different positions. So if you remove that diffusion panel, you do get slightly more light output, which could be good in certain settings if you need more output in a pinch. But just be aware that shadows can look a little bit weird. In fact, I'm just spotting it off camera here, so I'm going to be very unprofessional and just pan the camera while I'm filming. You can see over on the wall there, you can see colour band, sort of banding, you can see lines. Now, that might, you know, to your eye right now, just look like a sort of a colour banding issue because of the bit depth of the video, but it's not. That's what I'm seeing in real life, where you see those different lines on the wall, and that's just a shadow of the light itself, and it's just being, it's just casting that. And those lines are, are caused by all those different LEDs in there being casting shadows slightly differently. So that's just something to bear in mind is that's what will happen if you take out the diffusion panel. You'll get more light output, but you'll get some slightly weird shadows where sliding the diffusion panel does decrease the light output a little bit, but it gives you a slightly more uniform light. And as for the harshness, I've not had a problem with it at all. It's not really been an issue, but what I might actually look into getting is Neewer do sell soft boxes, and essentially what you do is you take the barn doors off these lights, they just unscrew from the front, and then they've got these pop-up soft boxes that you almost pop up, hook over the light, and it should soften it even more like a soft box. And those will still be a lot more convenient than my old soft boxes because they're still gonna be a lot smaller, a lot lighter, they'll fold up easier, and I don't have to use them with these lights, I can use them without lights without them as well. So I might look into those in the future. But yeah, the light output's pretty good. It is a little bit more harsh or harder light than a softbox, but it's still perfectly usable. You just need to maybe think about the positioning a little bit more. Okay, so now we're gonna do a quick comparison between the old softboxes and the new LED panels. So in this test, I've got both lights set up in the exact same positions. So I've got the camera in the middle and then the lights off to the side pointing at the table. What I've then done is I've white balanced against the wall at the back. So the, the color temperature difference between the lights won't be apparent. They're both white balanced correctly. There also isn't any colour grading applied. Normally I'll do a little bit of grading, especially with the new lights where I reduce the red slightly. However, I'm not going to do that here just to provide a fully fair comparison. So what we'll do is this is the soft boxes. Now if we switch over to the new LED panels, this is what you get here. Now the difference is very subtle, but I do notice that the colours, they do seem a little bit more vibrant. There's just a little more colour, especially on like the oranges and the box at the back of the orange there, it does just look a little bit better. So we'll flip back, this is us back with soft boxes again, and then we'll go back to the LED panel, and I'll just flip between the two, and you can kind of see that, at least to me, there's a slight difference, a slight improvement. What this also does show though, is what I was talking about, the shadows being a bit harsher. If you look at the soft boxes, you can see the shadows are a lot less pronounced than with the new LED panels. However, bear in mind with this, that the lights are positioned in the same way as each other. With the LED panels, they work a lot better if you position them a bit more carefully. So if I have, for example, one facing in the exact same angle as the camera and another one at a lower intensity off to the side, that tends to cut down on the shadows a bit. This sort of positioning I've got here is probably the worst case scenario for shadows, but it does show the difference in terms of the shadow harshness between the old soft boxes and the new lights. But yeah, I'm very happy with the color rendering. And even if it wasn't just for the slightly better light output, just the convenience of these LED panels means I'll take them over the soft boxes any day. So there you go. That's a look at the Neewer 660 LED panel. And as I've probably said a lot throughout this video, I really love these things. 
they're so much more convenient than my old soft boxes. Just the flexibility of being able to position them wherever I want them, even potentially stealing them out them if I needed to, is just so good. I can easily pack them up in a drawer rather than having to disassemble and reassemble massive soft boxes or store them fully assembled somewhere. They just slide neatly away in a drawer. I can transport them easily in a rucksack. They're absolutely brilliant. The app control, as I mentioned, is really good. It's really easy to use. It gives, you, gives a lot of control. But they need to fix that issue with forcing you to log into the app because that's not really acceptable in my mind. But definitely very happy. Definitely check these out. Now, as I mentioned earlier, do bear in mind all the different versions when you look at them because they've all got slightly different control mechanisms, as I mentioned, and it's kind of hard to see what they are. So if you're looking at them on somewhere like Amazon, check pictures of the back just to see what control mechanism you're getting. But yeah, definitely very happy with these. And if you're interested in buying them, there's links in the description.